when a humorless professor kidnaps the comics, it's Flash Gordon, Steve Canyon, the Phantom, Mandrake, and Lothar to the rescue. Sort of. Battle of the Network shows. Join Rick Brooks and Mike Kogel as they explore the TV of the 70s and 80s through hand-picked episodes of their favorite and not-so-favorite series. And welcome to another Battle of the Network shows. I'm Mike. I'm here with Rick, as always. Hey, everybody. And before we get into today's show... A little bit of the housekeeping reminder, you can contact us at mailbag at battleofthenetworkshows.com and uh, like our Facebook page and also join our new Facebook group, which we've started up and hopefully we'll have some fun discussions there about all sorts of things, 70s and 80s TV, not just the podcast. If you have friends who don't like podcasts but like that TV, you could recommend it to them. It's an excellent suggestion. It might lead them to liking podcasts, but Hmm. we won't judge if they don't. Right. No hard sell on our part. No. So... Anyway, I encourage you to visit us at one of those spots at our website, battleofthenetworkshows.com, on Twitter, at BatNetShows, and And our Instagram page, yes. Which is just Battle of the Network Shows. And with that, we're going to get into our seasonal animation episode. And I dare say the weirdest or one of the weirder things we've ever talked about. Yeah, I think this is kind of a, a, a rarity. Yeah. I had never heard of this before. I hadn't until... Uh, so I, I watched a few Popeye cartoons on Amazon, I think, and noticed that the ones from the, I guess, the 60s, the 50s or 60s, they're in color, and that they seemed like in one sort of episode, I guess, would between segments would seem radically different in styles, animation styles. And so I was curious about the whole animation history of Popeye because I know I'd been through various hands and things and and trying to figure out what i was watching the basic explanation of that is that that period of popeye they had three or four different animation studios doing shorts and then they later got combined and that's probably you know the bulk of the popeye i remember seeing as a kid Mm -hmm. uh, i think came from that era more than the sort of earlier period of the the fleischer brothers slash paramount period and and that period is like the period where they changed Bluto's name to Brutus because King Features thought for some reason that Bluto was an invention of the previous cart the Paramount cartoons and that they didn't own the name, which it turns out they did. Yeah, that's a bizarre thing. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, in in doing that and looking into that, I found about this cartoon, which is called Popeye Meets the Man Who Hated Laughter, or I think in the version we watched it just says the Man Who Hated Laughter. Mm-hmm. So it was part of a ABC series called the Saturday Superstar Movie, uh, which ran Saturday mornings in the early 70s. All animated. Honestly, I was reading a list of them, and I'm curious about many of them. I know. I was yeah. thinking the same thing. Like, I want to see all of these. Yeah. Uh, some of them were pilots that either got did get made into a series, like the Brady Bunch cartoon, or didn't, like the Bewitched one, a Lost in Space one. Some other things. I, I know one we had discussed at some point about doing is what we want to see so i won't spoil that one but it's the one that actually aired the week after this oh yes yes (laughs) and so yeah i I kind of want to see all of them and a few are available i guess and and different uh animation studios i believe right doing them rankin bass filmation hannah barbera and whoever did this one (laughs) i don't know and the unique part about this and also the part that makes it end up makes it uh turn out as weird as it is is that it features the majority of the comic strip characters syndicated by king features so that is a bundle of (laughs) comedic characters or humor characters and adventure characters Mm -hmm. all drawn in the animation basically in the whatever style of the comic strip yeah so you have this uh, first of all just odd mix of different humor styles but then you also have the in very limited animation, uh, the vaguely photorealistic adventure look. Mm-hmm. So on the, the dramatic or adventure side, you get the Phantom, 
uh, Mandrake and Lothar, Flash Gordons, and Steve Canyon. Some of their supporting players uh, pop up. Dale Arden shows up. The Phantoms, uh, what, Tim Tyler, his sidekick, I think. Uh, he actually had his own comic strip. Oh, he too. did. Yes. <laughs> okay. Prince Valiant makes a cameo. True. A really weird cameo. <laughs> and then on the humor side, of course, you have Popeye, which also includes Olive Oil and Sweet Pea and Brutus Tiger, who I wasn't familiar with. Blondie and Dagwood, High and Lois, Little Iodine, the Cats and Jammer Kids, Quincy, Beetle Bailey, Maggie and Jigs from Bringing Up Father, mm. The Little King, and Snuffy Smith. Yeah, so there are a few characters missing. Quite um, a roster. He, yeah. <laughs> so it's a strange, uh, strange thing, and we'll get into that. Obviously, when I read about it, I was like, well, oh, we got to see if this is available. And uh, you can find it on the YouTube. Yeah. We'll say that. Probably... Uh, Daily Motion too. It's like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, <laughs> only with comic strip characters. Yeah, they're all all coming together here. Uh, yeah. So you you're a fan of the comics pages. Yeah, of course. How many of these are ones you were? What level of familiarity did you have with these various characters? Good question. Almost all of them I was pretty familiar with. Some of them I'd m- mostly only heard of. When I was growing up, uh, Mandrake the Magician, I knew of him, mm-hmm. but. He was. I never had Mandrake in my area. I don't. I don't think or, or paid attention to that comic strip. Yeah. So some of him and even him and maybe the Phantom and, and to a lesser extent, Tim Tyler was one that I knew of him, but I'm not. I haven't read a lot of Tim T- Tyler. The one that was really stood out to me that I didn't really know that at all was uh, Quincy. Right. And Quincy gets a big push in this he, this movie, doesn't yes, he? He does. He's very prominent in it, and actually, it was a fairly long-running comic strip, I, yeah. I came to find out. But I think fairly new at that period, too. Yeah. yeah. This, uh, I forgot to put down the air date, but like 1972? Yes, October 7th, 1972. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I had heard of Little Iodine, and then I looked up her, and she spun out of They'll Do It Every Time. Yeah. I guess she was the annoying kid in that. Yeah. And, uh. I don't know what happened. In her, was she annoying in her own strip, too? Uh, from from what I've seen, yeah, I don't think they toned her down or anything. <laughs> it wasn't like one of those ones where they spin somebody off and like, well, we can't have a character that annoying be. No, no, they, she was pretty annoying. Yeah. Um, Fussy and self-centered. <laughs> like Tiger, I said I had never heard of that. Yeah, that was a long-running uh, comic strip. Uh, yeah. Bud Blake and kind of like a gang of kids, and it had kind of a distinctive drawing style. Mm-hmm. And... Like the, the like the kid with the Hugo, I think, that had the big tooth, like kind of a big snaggle tooth, <laughs> and Tiger with a baseball cap. Uh-huh. And I don't really know a lot about their individual personalities, but I do remember that, that comic strip being around. But Oh, and did you mention uh, Henry was in this one as well? Who was Henry? Henry's the uh, bald-headed kid that never says anything. Oh, yeah. I, well, for some reason, He's I thought he a was large head. part of the bringing up father. Oh, okay, okay. No, no. He, it, he's in, like, in one of the scenes, they kind of make it sound like because they want to check on him or something like that. Okay. I think the, I think Maggie says something like, where's Henry or something. But, yeah, Henry had his own strip. And uh, some of these I didn't really know at all until growing up I would read about other comic strips. And mm-hmm. then, oh, you're learning a little bit about comics history. Henry was another one that was long-running strip that, in my area, I don't, I don't think I ever had Henry. Yeah. The Cats and Jammer kids, my dad used to reference them a lot for some reason, but I never read them or saw yeah. them. And then there's a whole weird thing where there are like two competing Cats yeah. and Jammer kids strips or something. Right, and, yeah. There was uh, <laughs> there's like syndicate and ownership dis- disputes with them. And again, they were like, the, the visuals of those characters were very recognizable mm-hmm. to me, but the actual comic strip I didn't read until years later, like going back and looking at them. And it was written in dialect, too, so I, I uh, wasn't as fond of strips that were written in dialect like that. It was kind of harder for me to get into. Yeah, that bringing up father is the same thing. It, like, the visuals look familiar, but I... Yeah, I love bringing up father. That was kind of like... Uh, and and their, their voices kind of surprised me in this, but... They, they weren't how I would picture the voices, but mm-hmm. I guess it doesn't really surprise me. I guess they're supposed to, you know, upper class kind of, uh, especially the, the wife, Maggie, has pretensions. Right. They're like nouveau yeah. Rich, right? And he's kind of more of like a more vulgar. Yeah. And kind of a lot of the stereotype of a henpecked husband and a, a sh- kind of a shrewish wife nagging him all the time. But uh-huh. I think the old bring up fathers that I've seen are very, very funny. So okay. I like them. 
the Little King I've only become aware of like recently. Yeah, kind of like, like when collections. Like pantomime. Yeah. Uh, strip basically. Yeah. Yeah, but I know it was a big deal at some point. Yeah, and a lot of these ones were were very long running. I mean, mm-hmm. even at this point, they had been around like thirty or forty years, and I was surprised to to learn that they went into the eighties or early nineties. Some of these like legacy strips. Yeah. You know, some of them obviously are still around, like Blondie right. and High and Lois, uh, Beetle Bailey. Mm-hmm. Those are kind of like some of the big ones, but yeah. I, I was more interested to see some of these other ones. Although I did like seeing like High and Lois because there's not a whole lot of uh, TV representations of some of these even more famous ones. Yeah. And frankly, Popeye I didn't know as a comic strip or that it had those roots until fairly recently because it was so ubiquitous I think when we were kids as a cartoon yeah it all like they'd either be the older cartoons on, on for me on TBS but uh, but then there were very those variations in the 80s yeah Popeye and Son and yeah yeah the new adventures of Popeye yeah and, and some really weird ones uh, there's always talk about uh, Popeye revivals and they're mm-hmm. trying to keep the character alive and licensing he was really strong when I was growing up. There were toys and everything. Popeye brand spinach, I think they actually had for a while. And some Come other, right. there's another food item that I think that there was a Popeye I think brand. There's, wasn't there a Wimpy's restaurant chain? Oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds familiar. But there might have been another. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But the character was huge. And right. I think you'd also see him in the Macy's uh, Thanksgiving parade. Yeah. Things like that. I think. But I remember, like, the movie, mm-hmm. I, I may have even gotten into Popeye first, well, probably just because of the cartoons, but, you know, the Robin Williams movie was real big. And then right. kind of like a little bit after that, my, my father was a fan of old animation. He kind of showed me the, the old original black and white Popeye cartoons, yeah. which I thought were great. And so so I guess early on, I kind of, and that kind of got me into exploring the, the comic strip history of Popeye. Although, when I first became aware of it, it wasn't as easy to find those old ones as it is now where the right. series is being reprinted uh, from the beginning, I guess. But yeah. uh, it's kind of a shame. Uh, there's always talk. I, I think the, the creator of Samurai Jack was going to do a CGI Popeye at one point. I don't know mm-hmm. what the status is of that, but the character seems a little bit dormant right now. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, he's kind of up there in a way with like Mickey Mouse and, and some of those other characters, certainly from that period. Right. He was, like you said, everywhere well, for a very long time. And I was thinking about this uh, earlier, actually, is Mickey Mouse is almost relevant. Periodically, Disney tries to revive him and make him relevant to general audiences. Mm -hmm. And I respect that they're doing that. But it seems like the way, the main way that they've kept Mickey Mouse going is to, as an ongoing character, is to gear him more towards younger children. Yeah. And Popeye just didn't seem to have that that outlet right now. I don't know if you could do a whole show around Popeye right now. Yeah, I don't know. And I feel like it would be done as many of them are now uh, revivals are in a little different style which yeah. might be okay but like in a spongebob right Teen titans go uh, that's sort of more a zany angular kind of style right it's just amazing though and you talked about like when we were growing up and even maybe a little bit i think maybe a little bit before our time perhaps but when you had like the whole children hosts kind of phenomenon mm-hmm. of local personalities hosting cartoon shows a lot of times it would be like the Popeye hour or the Popeye show and yeah. you'd have like these things built around that this package of Popeye cartoons that was floating around most of these like kind of like the later ones like you were talking about right and yeah they were they were everywhere yeah and you know in comic books as well even even then I remember you know the licensed uh, probably Whitman or Gold Key mm-hmm. you know companies like that would do Popeye comics and I'd always uh, be into them so I always liked the character from as, as long as I can remember. Yeah. But yeah, never came across this movie at all. Right. I mean, it probably aired once and yeah, that was it. And I mean, the, I don't know the, at least the version I watched, it had some Captain Crunch commercials in it. Yeah. It didn't have any other commercials though. Yeah. It was like, I don't know if that was the only sponsor or what yeah. the deal was with that. Yeah. And I, and I think, and one of the producers of this was the guy that did a lot of the Popeye cartoons and also, he did those 1960s Beetle Bailey cartoons uh-huh. and Snuffy Smith cartoons. Okay. So he had a pre-existing relationship with uh, King Features, yeah. apparently, and he was, I think, one of the main producers on this. Okay. But so, like, some of, quote-unquote, the main story segments, which yeah. we can get into, 
those seem more like those uh, earlier 60s Beetle Bailey cartoons, mm -hmm. and maybe that's sort of like the default kind of style. But yeah, as you mentioned, like the, the whole uh, movie is an amalgamation of all these different kind of yeah. looks. It's kind of weird. Right. So it starts out with, I guess, a teaser scene, but then you never see that scene again. But that teaser scene essentially takes place after a lot of the other stuff of the main story. Like in, So in the teaser scene, the adventure characters are summoned to a meeting at the White House hmm. because as uh, this chief of staff or whoever this guy is, I don't know, he looks like John Oliver, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, or maybe he's supposed to look like Kissinger or something, but the chief is concerned, and not the president, but the chief. Hmm. Yeah. He's concerned because the comics have disappeared. Yeah. He's fascinated by that term, the comics, and they don't mean the stand-up comics, and they don't mean like just a comics page, of course, because these guys are part of the comics page too, Yeah, even if they're not comedic. They're... But he means the humorous ca characters from the comics page have disappeared and he's worried that the citizens of America will have nothing to laugh at except politicians, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really a political concern. Yeah. He flat out says, <laughs> this is a political concern. We need to, <laughs> right. And, and, they, and they send the, the adventure guys to go find them. Yeah. And then we get to opening credits. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting uh, premise, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we meet our villain Professor Morbid Grim Grimsby, yeah. who hates laughter. He's just mean. He's won six Meany Awards in a row, and he wants to rid the world of laughter. So he's going. He's cooking up a plan with his evil supercomputer and Brutus, who's wearing a turban for no good reason. Uh, yeah, <laughs> to rid the world of the, of the comics. Yeah, Brutus is a real stooge in this uh, he movie. He is, yeah, for sure. A flunky, more uh, than the uh, diabolical uh, mastermind uh, that he is in other, uh, yeah. <laughs> in other media. Yeah, I, that's a pretty good uh, explanation, <laughs> yeah, of him. And I would say, especially in the scenes with the professor, which take up a whole lot of the show, yeah. um, like the animation style is really, really, really loose. Yeah. Like almost sketchy mm -hmm. and they're like weird kind of things like sort of sound effects appearing you know uh, the way they would in a comic strip on the screen mm. um a couple of times they're like th like a thought balloon that has an image inside it which i always enjoy that as yeah a, as a uh a tool but it's still a little weird to see and he's sort of a typical depiction of, of a crazy scientist i guess he's bald and has a mustache and you get a whole bunch of jokes where he tells brutus to push a button and brutus pushes the wrong button yeah i mean five or six times they did that yeah <laughs> they did. his scheme he's going to send an invitation to the comics to uh yeah. to take a yacht trip and to make it even better he's inviting popeye to be the captain yeah. So then we, we see them getting their invitations, and we get various bits of comedy relating to some of these characters. For instance, we get a classic Dagwood running over the mailman scene. Yeah. I, I like the fact that uh, I, I believe this uh, establishes that High and Lois are, the Flagstons are neighbors of Blondie and Dagwood. Seems like it, yeah. <laughs> Which is cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah, and... Like, whose dog? That was Dagwood's dog, right? Uh, Daisy? Yeah. High and, do High and Lois have a dog? Yeah, his name is Dog. Oh, okay. Like D-A-W-G, I think. <laughs> he's more of a, uh, he's more of like a Dennis Mitchell's dog. Okay. Boy, they could have used Dennis the Menace. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we learned that. Uh, we see Beetle and the Sarge eating at a Chinese restaurant. For some yeah. reason, they get... Beetle gets his invitation and a fortune cookie. Yeah, that was an interesting uh, yeah. delivery mechanism. Um, my favorite part of that, they were sitting at one table, and General Halftrack and Lieutenant Flap were sitting at the other. Yeah. I just liked that Lieutenant Flap was there. Yeah. I didn't like that I 
was thinking he was his name was Lieutenant Fuzz, which is the other right guy. But uh, still, I, I liked that he got a cameo in there. Yeah, and that they're just you know sitting next to each other, right? Or adjoining tables. Yeah, adjoin uh, like table like ta- six or eight person tables. Yeah, <laughs> he's pretty swank, uh, yeah. semicircle booth like kind of uh, right. <laughs> But the the main thing, I think, I don't know if the Dagwood scene had established it, but this definitely establishes an ongoing theme in this, which is, um, or, or reestablishes. I think we saw Wimpy already. A lot of these comic strip characters have some eating issues. Uh, good point, yes. Like, Wimpy packs Very good multiple point. bags of hamburgers to take with him. Yeah. Of course, we know he loves hamburgers. Right. He'll gladly uh, pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Yeah. And the Sarge, for some reason, piles up a bunch of food, I mean, and eats that. Yeah. And, well, later a horse eats musical instruments. There's like a giant... And there's Dagwood's whole sandwich business. Yeah. And there's like a whole, like, sandwich-making contest yes. of some kind with the kids. R- r- right. <laughs> well, uh, to be fair, I've done the same thing in the Chinese restaurants as Sarge has. <laughs> I often... If I go to a buffet, I'm piling my plate up as high as it'll right. go. But you're, yes, I see your point. And then there's, you know, Popeye's whole spinach deal. And he brought a lot of spinach, too. Like, I mean, he brings tons of cans of spinach. I don't yeah. Know if he needs all that. And then, then there's. Cause it's better to have extra. Olive oils, possibly body issues. and Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. I don't know. I mean. It's a strange world. The adventure heroes seem to have, uh, you know, they don't seem to have these kind of issues. No, I don't think they eat at all. No. <laughs> I don't think Steve Canyon loaded any supplies on his plane. Uh, no. But I'm sure he eats a healthy diet. Yeah. Mostly uh, protein. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. He's used to K rations from the That's right. In the service anyway, probably. So. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever gotten an invitation to a yacht ride and a fortune cookie, Mike? <laughs> no. No. I haven't gotten an invitation to a yacht ride, period. And uh, <laughs> that's a shame. Well, maybe... Okay. Maybe one will turn up soon. Uh, yeah, certainly not in a fortune cookie. No. And anyway, everybody shows up at the boat. They all load on the boat and uh, go off to to set. They set sail. Yeah, and I'd like to point out a little bit of socially relevant dialogue. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> when uh, Quincy, it, and at this point, I it took me a minute to realize I, I wasn't quite getting the name. I didn't know the character. I, yeah. I thought he was one of Tiger's crew, but. Uh, I think it's Quincy that says, points out, it's an integrated boat ride, boys and girls. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, well. <laughs> it's <I> like, don't... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to th- how to take that joke. <laughs> and maybe if I had read more Quincy, I would know. Yeah. Because I did, I read that it had like a, like he had a white friend. And that was considered satire of the whole idea of, you know, white people saying, oh, I have a black friend. Ah, uh, hmm. But, so maybe it always had, like, little jokes like yeah, that. Yeah, I think, I think maybe it did. I'm going to, I'm going to seek out uh, some more, more Quincy. Yeah. And not just the medical examiner, Quincy. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's nowhere to be seen in this movie, by the way. No. <laughs> Unfortunate. <laughs> they set sail. Wimpy, by the way, is the first mate, and the chef, and sorts of things. Yeah, I think he's overextended a little bit. Popeye maybe should have gotten another crew member or two. Yeah. Sweet Pea seems very capable. I mean, he can read. Yeah. Which apparently Popeye can't. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet Pea is, is, is with it, know. that's for sure. Yeah. And while we're there, there, there are all sorts of little shenanigans going on. The Cast and Jammer kids causing trouble. Yes, there's plenty of antics. The, the king keeps kind of a classic ship gag, I think. He's in like a folding lounge chair and it People keep running by and it falls. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yep. Uh, that's... A thing where they drain the pool just as Sarge is going to dive into it. Yeah, uh, that looked painful. Yeah, that didn't quite work, but. Uh... That was bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's like a lot of these little moments that, like, again, it sort of adds to the overall weird feeling of this cartoon. Yeah. Like, trying to work in gags and also serve this overall story. I'm not sure that it always works, but. It was very interesting to watch. Yeah. And and the whole time, the professor, of course, has one of those satellites that can see anything. Yeah. And he's watching all of this on his supercomputer. Yeah. Uh, eventually has 
plans to lure them to his secret island lair. Meanwhile, we get, oh, as we mentioned, uh, Sparkplug, Snuffy Smith's horse, eats a drum set and a guitar, for sure. And the guitar, you know, sticking in his body, like the shape of the guitar. And he's able to strum it through his body. Yeah. yeah. Talk about a horse act. Now, that would be a, <laughs> that would draw us some money, I think, if you put yeah. that horse in the circuit playing guitar like that. Right, yeah. <laughs> that would pack houses from Altoona to Sheboygan. Especially when you add in olive oil and a bikini. Oh, hey. Ooh. Yeah, that was... That's Singing right. about her bikini. Yeah, now, is this... Uh, this is like where they make a deal to put on a... Is this, this part mm, this of the show? This before that. Okay, this part of the... That's right. They just do this song. Oh, that's just for... Their own entertainment on the ship. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I think Quincy and Little Iodine are involved in that somehow, too. Yeah, they're supposed to Or they to were be. supposed to be the band. Yeah. Them and uh, maybe Tiger, definitely one of the other kids. And since Sparkplug ate everything, they couldn't be the band. Mm. Show-stopping set piece. <laughs> and we, Brutus is watching it on the you know the satellite, and his hearts are flying around his head. And mm. you know you think, oh, there's going to be some conflict there. He's going to wrestle with his emotions about do do I let the professor do this, mm. or do I help them and and save Olive? Or do I just save all of them and leave the rest? Yeah. There's no conflict. He doesn't really act on no. any of that. He doesn't seem to have internal yeah, he doesn't. thoughts. I mean, maybe he could have you know, thought of, hey, maybe I should invent MTV after seeing this. <laughs> but no, he doesn't even have that idea. Nope. <laughs> There's really nothing going on in this, this version of the character. No. No. And then not long after that, the professor uses the next part of his plan which he uses like a sort of like a tractor beam to pull them toward the island mm. and the ship sinks and, and all of Popeye's spinach sinks to the bottom oh, what a loss that is mostly because olive oil makes him get all our clothes he doesn't yeah. have time to save the spinach that was a little uh, short sighted of olive yeah he won't be saved his hamburgers I think but uh, <laughs> that's good yeah yeah Popeye needs his spinach yeah I would have saved the spinach first. I don't know. I don't know how they're going to... Or at least some of it. What they're going to do without a spinach. No. And then they get imprisoned on the island. Basically, he's going to hold them there for forever so that the world will stop laughing. Yeah. Without the comics. Right. There can be no laughter. That's right. There's we know. no other sources of humor. Yeah. <laughs> it's been established. Yeah. It must have been a, a dark time in, in popular culture in 1972. Uh, yeah. If the comics was the only source of humor. Right. I mean, I, I don't want to get political here, but I wonder if the uh, the Nixon administration had anything to do with this. Hmm. Was there know. was there a federal ban on humor at this point, <laughs> except for the the comics? <laughs> he might have been working on that. Yeah. Uh, well, there were so many subversives, you know, yeah. on TV and movies, and I mean, the cartoon definitely hedged its bets and um, hid hid the president from view and just called him the chief. Yeah. So, I don't know. I guess maybe they thought this would last forever. Yeah. Well, I, I guess, yeah, you're right. Like In, in, in this uh, universe, uh, the president is actively working to bring them back. Yeah. But there's definitely unanswered questions about the, the state of humor in general in the United States. And in this cartoon. Um. <laughs> hey! Despite the razor-sharp commentary of Quincy... <laughs> It may have been lacking in other right. places, yes. Yeah. Uh, there's one one of those button gags where uh, somehow a bunch of water gets dumped on the professor. Mm. So then he uses some sort of time dial. <laughs> and they actually run the, everything backwards. <laughs> it seems like they could have spent... I mean, uh, of the button gags, it might be the, the, the cream of the crop, but... yeah. The creamed spinach of the crop. Um, <laughs> uh, but it seems like they could have given that time to one of these other, you know, one of the comics who doesn't get a lot of time. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen, in general, more of the comics yeah. than Grimsby. Right. And then somewhere during this, that's when we start to see the adventure people uh, searching for them. Yeah. They, the adventures. Yeah. They, <laughs> right. They... Uh, 
symbol. So and... Steve, Mandrake, and Lothar are flying in Steve's plane, and uh, first the professor uses some sort of illusion thing to project his face into the sky, and uh, you know I think Steve does comment on how hideous that is. Yeah, it's kind of a cool uh, effect, but yeah. And then he projects fire, and Mandrake, being magician, figures out that it's just an illusion. But then they get tractor beamed down and end up in a like a cave. Yeah, there's some weird stuff uh, going on. Like Flash Gordon keeps babbling about his solar radar fi- radio finder, or something yeah. like that. I don't know exactly know what that is. Yeah, like he's f- orbiting Earth in a rocket. Yeah, and he, they call him, and he he comes down, and he <laughs> they're like these robot tank things. And, Flash just, like, punches one. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, that smarts. <laughs> of course it does. Yeah. He just punched a robot. Right. <laughs> Don't have a ray gun you could have shot at it or something? Well, he does. Later he uses his ray gun. Yeah. Instead but he... Somehow the tangling with them breaks the solar radio, which, you know, just means Dale can't come help. I don't think it had any other function. No, <laughs> they call no, they mentioned it, yeah. And so they're they're trapped in this cave, and then a skull shaped door on the wall just opens, and the Phantom and Tim Tyler walk out. Yeah, <laughs> right. And apparently, there's I, I don't know where this island is in relation to anything in the world, but uh, there's some sort of subterranean tunnel that leads directly to it from Africa. That's where the Phantom lives, right? Yeah, that's where he. Rome's, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, I like the Phantom's voice. I, it, it seemed like most of the voices were done by one person. I think there are like three. I think I think you read that there's the Popeye guy. Yeah. And the guy, and maybe the guy that does Brutus does all the other male voices. Yeah. And yeah. the woman who does olive oil does all the female right. voices. Right. Which was interesting <laughs> that they definitely took an economic approach to <laughs> the voice talent, didn't they? Right. Uh, but I, I kind of like the the Phantom. He he sounds pretty cool. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that that performance. And did like his wolf or something shows up? At the, the Phantom's there's some sort of wolf who seems to be on their side. Yeah, but uh, he wasn't with them when I don't know they that, came out of that tunnel. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure that yeah. what the Phantom's wolf character the deal is. Anyway, they're excited because they're like, well, okay, when we get out of here, we can just go that way. But then there's uh, the vo- the island is a volcano, and of course there's a rock slide and the tunnel gets blocked and they're trapped in there yeah um meanwhile back in the comedy side of things this is when the olive oil she she does uh, take charge she seems like a weird mix of uh, different olive oils yeah like the the more take charge olive oil but also like the weird more girly olive oil mm-hmm. um but she's like we'll put on a show <laughs> and make you laugh yeah so they and uh gonna make a deal yeah and he agrees to it for i guess he's so confident in his meanness yeah there, there's no way they can make him laugh which I, based on the show they put on mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> he, 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 he's on to something yeah well he's probably got a rather, rather dull existence right i mean he hates laughter but that doesn't mean he can't be entertained a little bit maybe I, maybe that's what he's thinking right yeah that's I, true i can appreciate good music yeah. and theater and, I mean, like that. being an evil genius, wouldn't uh, is he opposed to evil laughter? Uh, good question. Yeah, he, is that how he's so mean that he can't even evil laugh? He does a, a blanket condemnation of all laughter, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you, if you can't enjoy evil laughter, uh, that you may be irredeemable. Yeah, oh, I don't know how they're gonna get out of this. I don't know either, especially since the adventure heroes seem to be. They're far more inept than I had yeah. anticipated. <laughs> yeah, they uh, try to crawl through a vent, and Professor just pulls a lever, and they fall through a trap door into a different cave. Yeah. I, I mean, this is the kind of thing that explains to me why, when I was a kid, I often shied away from the adventure strips and yeah. just read the comic strips. Right. And Steve Canyon, in particular, seems a little, like, stupid. Yeah, he's almost more like... Uh, yeah, stupid's maybe a little harsh, yeah. but I, I, I kind of like a just a bland flyboy kind of. Uh, yeah. Not not a. He just makes some odd like sort of. He's not a ooh, tactical genius. Like, well, how did that happen? Kind of yeah. comments. I don't right. remember exactly. 
a, a specific line. But yeah, he uh, does come off like kind of a rube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, we get to see Popeye do an Ed Sullivan impression. Oh, Did yeah. you ever think? I mean. On the list of things with Popeye that you thought you'd see. Right. Would Popeye doing an Ed Sullivan come before or after him in a special with all the other King Features <laughs> characters? I would much be more inclined to believe he would be in a special with other characters than do an Ed Sullivan. That threw me. <laughs> yeah. That threw me. <laughs> but I guess this was like the, maybe the last year of Ed Sullivan. Or right. I think he was still so, I guess if you're going to be an MC. Yep. You can either play it straight or you can do Ed Sullivan. Yeah. Those are your only choices. And Popeye decided to do Ed Sullivan. <laughs> it's a pretty good impersonation, though. Yeah. I mean, he's no, you know, Will Jordan or whoever that guy was, but uh, right. he's a serviceable Ed Sullivan. I for, knew what he was doing. Especially for someone who has such a distinctive voice. Yeah. yeah. To be able to even modulate it at all. Right. And, that's, uh, yeah. and the, the gestures, the body language. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the highlights of the, the special, actually. Definitely the highlight of the, the show they put on for me. Right. This was Popeye as the MC. Yeah. But some of the other highlights of the show include uh, Olive Oil forcing Iodine and Quincy to improvise a song called the the Comic Strip Rag. Rag. Yeah, that was a little uh, another offbeat part of this uh, special. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't overly impressed with their the song, but you yeah. know, for short notice, I give them credit for improvising. They try, and I I give the special try uh, credit for not having them be perfect. Yeah, that's that's like they they kind of mumble a few lines and then say the comic book rag. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that, that that's that's good. I agree with that. Yeah, because otherwise Quincy is quite quite the uh, perfect character, but yeah, so he needs a little. Little setback there. Right, right. Yeah. And Professor is not laughing at any of this stuff. No, there's a couple of animal acts in there. Yeah. Two dog acts back to back actually, which I think Popeye even comments on that, doesn't right, he? Right, I think so, yeah. The I don't think Sullivan ever booked animal acts back to back. Yeah. One of them involve doesn't it involve Wimpy? Uh it involves some or Sarge. The, yeah, the Sarge and, and Otto, Otto, his dog, yeah. Yeah, and, and Sarge does all the the dog tricks. Yeah. I was entertained by that. Yeah. That seems about He's right. He's doing tricks while Otto's uh, barking commands. Yeah. Uh, that was kind of cool. I always liked the image of Otto. Yeah. The little, little bulldog and... and wearing a, a uniform. Wearing a uniform. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Otto's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the adventure side, the Phantom fights a saber-toothed tiger that comes out of nowhere, and they have to deal with uh, lava, and they finally get out of the lava area... Yeah, and that, that's kind of a, a recurring theme. I think it's like Phantom, isn't it, that keeps saying, hey, there's an active volcano yeah. here. and So right. it, it gives a sense of urgency to the mission. Yes, and occasionally the camera shakes. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, they like use a line. I don't know where they got the rope, but they have a rope. And uh, they use that and cross over, and it snaps all the Phantom's crossing, but of course he climbs to safety because he's the Phantom. Mm-hmm. But they, they get out in this other area and... I think by then the professor maybe has gone to uh, get something to eat, but uh, which we'll come back to. The Brutus puts on a, like a buckets and stuff to dress as a knight, and I think this is one of the places where Steve Canyon displayed his sort of not quite what you'd expect. Uh, well, I put Steve Canyon as an idiot, but uh, he definitely buys into the fact that this is a knight. Yeah, and yeah, he's in silhouette, right. and maybe I don't know. Sure, why not a knight showing up? Because Mandrake just summons Prince Valiant out of nowhere. Yeah, and Prince Valiant, uh, Brutus figures out it's Prince Valiant, and runs away. Now, if if you were in the position of these guys and you've already had to deal with all of these tasks, would okay. you like see an advantage of maybe keeping Prince Valiant around? <laughs> Yeah. Another member of the team. He's got a horse. He's got a sword. Yeah. He's good in a scrape. Yep. He's very articulate. Right. He speaks well. Uh, yeah. He's got a, well, not a cool haircut, but. <laughs> no. I would have summoned Superman or something like that. Well. Instead of Prince Valiant, but. You, you can know. only summon who's in the, you know, a yeah. king feature. Actually, you know, why. I, I was just going to say that I may not have summoned Prince Valiant because whenever. Prince Valiant appeared in my Sunday comic strip. I would often lose consciousness 
right? If I tried to sit and read it too long, I just was yeah. not a fan. Never really appreciated Prince Valiant, so I didn't either. I, I see it now, or see reprints of right. it, and you're like, oh, well, at least the art is beautiful. Yeah, I can appreciate I'm it more. Still now. not sure about how they tell stories, but yeah, uh, and I'm kind of surprised that it's still around. Yeah, you know, Prince Valiant. That was one that maybe this happened, but you. It always seemed to me like I, I just knew, I knew in quotation marks that, like, from week to week, like, there'd be, like, six months of things happening between those strips. You mm. can't tell me that that it was, like, a, in sequence, you know? Right. It's like, well, none of this happened last time. What What's going on here? How are they, are they telling this one Sunday at a time? Right. And it was confusing because it was often just, like, the one, I guess the Sunday one has a few panels sometimes. But. Yeah, I mean... And I think for quite a while, Prince Valiant was the token adventure strip in my paper. Uh-huh. So yeah. it would stick out even more. You'd get like all the comic, like the, the funnies, and then you'd get maybe Shylock comics for kids or something, and then Prince Valiant <laughs> would kind of be stuck on the same page with right. puzzles or something like that. I think it would be... I imagine back in the old days when you had like comics taking up full pages and yeah. how sweet was that. Right. There would be, okay, here's your Steve Canyon, here's your Prince Valiant, here's your Phantom and... You'd have like a real rhythm to it, but Prince Valiant just always stood out to me. And yeah, I might have been one of the only adventure ones in my comics too. There were definitely a number of the soaps. Yeah, especially on the Sunday page. Yeah, like I don't think, like uh, I didn't get anything like, uh, and there was I think Steve. Well, some of them might have been going on. Dick Tracy maybe for a mm, while. Yeah, yeah. But Prince Valiant, the way it was drawn, I mean, certainly it was a throwback to the old days when you had like the Flash Gordon and right. the, the really beautifully rendered. Yeah illustrated comics but yeah i never got into really prince valiant so i was kind of afraid when mandrake summoned him that it would would bring this show to a halt (laughs) so you're okay that he sent him back yeah you know i I, you make a good point that he would definitely would have been useful and i i question the the strategy behind it but as a viewer i wasn't sorry to see him go okay it's a confusing move though yeah i I don't know how they explain it but they don't it's like oh this isn't prince valiant's fight yeah. Okay, you, you go ahead back. We'll take care of this on our own. you got to get back to uh, your beautiful world of yeah. whatever's going on there. Yeah. Princesses and, I don't know. And, cr- and crusades and... Gorgeous s- fonts. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not, you, Calligraphy. <laughs> you don't belong in this ugly world. Yeah. You, you don't belong in this... This animation is not... This isn't right. your animation... Maybe Hal Foster was like 10 seconds. You can have 10 seconds. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> he stipulated that he, that he could not right. look a certain way. You know, he had to just get in and out of there. Yeah. Anyway, in the kitchen, the the kids, did they, they went up there to build a sandwich for Dagwood? Or did they want food? I thought that they wanted food, but... Uh, they decide to build a Dagwood for Dagwood. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, the whole thing just kind of got carried away. Clearly, they were newbies at this. Dagwood himself would have done this, you know, with ease. Yeah. But uh, they, they kind of bite off, bite off a little bit more than they can chew, I think, with the sandwich assembly. Yeah. I, I think they're enamored with the idea of making one. Yeah. Well, and and they do, you know, they do, use teamwork, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, long before Subway, these kids were using teamwork to. Yeah. Uh, to build a sandwich. Yeah, uh, that assembly line yeah. process going. Quincy assigns people different uh, parts of it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the sandwich they make is, is it's like 20 feet tall or something. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Quincy keeps dropping it and then catching it. And, and then for some reason he wants them to add more lettuce and tomato. Yeah. It's like, it's almost it's like already a... perfect. You have the, once you have a piece of bread on the top. Yeah. Your sandwich is done. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's the capper to it. Right. I don't think a Dagwood, I don't know. I guess some Dagwoods have might maybe have layers. Yeah, of I, think, I think, yeah. It, it, it's a maniacal approach. It, it's concerning. Yeah. And I don't see any of them washing their hands either before they prepare the sandwich. So right. I, I've got concerns about that. Yeah, especially if those Cass and Jammer kids are around. Uh, who you knows know they, what they slipped into that sandwich? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> who knows what they were touching before? I mean, you know. Yeah, well... Accidentally or deliberately, yeah. I'll bet they had their mark on that sandwich. Oh God! Good thing Dagwood didn't get to eat it, yeah. because Quincy drops it and it falls through multiple uh, floors or levels of this 
this complex, <laughs> including going right past the adventure people. And uh, this might have been my favorite moment. Flash says <laughs> very, uh, very dryly, that was a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not that was a sandwich. Now that's a sandwich. Yeah. It's that almost like. Just like. It's almost there's like. There's a bird. Yeah. Yeah, just pointing out that it's a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh. And then we get this bit where the. I mean, this is really the. I guess the climactic moment in a way. The, uh, the professor starts mar- making scary faces at the kids, and the kids are making goofy faces back at him. Yeah. Well, but wait a minute, though. So just to clarify, if I yeah. may. The sandwich is gone, right? Does the yeah. five-second rule does not apply in an island? I don't think in, so. In an I, evil I, lair? I believe it, it maybe landed in the lava. Oh, ah, okay. So, yeah. yeah. I, I've eaten worse, but... I think Dagwood would still eat it. Yeah, he probably would and could. Sarge would also eat it. Yeah. Wimpy would... Well, it's not a hamburger, so I don't know. Spark plug would Spark eat it. Spark plug would eat it, yeah. Olive oil probably wouldn't. No. No, it was it was an epic sandwich. I, I just yeah. wanted to, to give the proper requiem to yeah, yeah, that sandwich. epic sandwich. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It held together through that entire fall, though. Yeah, I it guess it must the... have had a long toothpick in it. Yeah. <laughs> a really <laughs> long toothpick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think that that must explain it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so they're making the scary faces, and then they hold up a mirror to the professor's face and his own face which he doesn't realize is his own face makes him makes him laugh and they win i don't technically that's that's not the bet they made you know that you're right about that aren't you um they really didn't make him laugh that that's it's kind of a loophole at best it's sketchy but luckily the power of laughter is so uh, strong that he he immediately just becomes the nicest person in the world. Yeah, I guess laughter has, has really changed him. Yeah, also impending doom because the volcano <laughs> is finally erupting. <laughs> That'll change it too. But, it, I mean, the previous professor just would have left them there. Yeah. He would have been, like, gone and gotten his sub. He probably would have left Brutus there. Mm-hmm. Just himself. Let these guys die at the bottom of the ocean. Wow. And frankly, why would Brutus be... He should be imprisoned with the other comics anyway. Yeah, he gets he's, a special exemption of some kind, I guess. Yeah, he's part of the comics. Like, unless maybe maybe the thinking is that Brutus is... Like, Popeye would be a lot funnier if, if Brutus wasn't screwing things up for him all the time. Mm. Uh, maybe that's the thinking. Yeah. Eh, I don't know. Because, you know, keep in mind that that supercomputer he has is a talking computer, too. And right. The computer seems pretty powerful on its own. Yeah. Probably could have done a lot of the functions that Brutus did better. Yeah, like maybe just had internal buttons. Yeah, <laughs> self-pushing button. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that there would have been a big improvement, definitely. Certainly, yeah. Flaw in the professor's design, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the thing. Not having access to laughter or not willing to being willing to engage in laughter, mm-hmm. it affects your thinking long-term, I believe. Yeah. Anyway, they all run down to his sub. Uh, olive oil kind of comes on to Steve Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> Another one yeah. of the weirder moments in, right, in right. one of many. Because also the way, like the way they drew Popeye and olive oil is an especially exaggerated version of them. Mm. I mean, I don't know how there's not an exaggerated version. Like they had the just like the black eyes and mm-hmm. you know her nose is very long and uh, so it looks even the the incongruity of her hugging. Oh, it's, Steve Canyon! Yeah. Steve Canyon is is strange. True. They get in the sub and they're escaping and and they get trapped in some rocks. How are they going to get out of this? Well, maybe Mandrake the magician can uh, show up and and trick the rocks into thinking that they're dust and, and then they just crumble or something. That's an like idea. That. I mean, he's on the sub, so. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Quincy can think up something again. Yeah, Quincy seems to be a clever lad. Maybe Snuffy Smith can reveal whatever his talents are. Hmm. I don't know. He can steal some rocks. <laughs> yeah. Well. I don't know. Beetle and Sarge could use some of their military know-how. Yeah, they should have a, a way out of this. Or Sarge could just eat the rocks. 
Well, uh, <laughs> get him and Wimpy and Dagwood together, and they just, eat the rocks. <laughs> I'd like that. Yeah. Or uh, maybe there's something on the bottom of the ocean that they can use. A starfish, a clam. Uh, or how about a, a pile of spinach cans? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be nice if yeah. there happened to be a bunch of spinach at the bottom of the ocean. Right. And there is. So Popeye swims out there, and this is a good Popeye moment. I don't think we got, you know, much of, like, the him eating the spinach and then stuff. da 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 Yeah. And the whole deal. Right. Yeah. Steamship battleships on his arms. Right, all, right. All that. But he does eat the spinach, and then he uses a sawfish as a jackhammer and breaks up the rocks and uh, frees them. The thing where olive oil slinks through a periscope. <laughs> uh, and they're all good, and then they have a party at the White House. Yeah. That intricate plotting of this movie. Yeah. They established early on that the spinach was gone and then they came back to That's it. That's right. Everybody well, knows no. when a sp- <laughs> can of spinach ends up at the bottom of the ocean, at some point it'll get eaten. Yeah. It was one of those checkoff rules. Yeah. Mr. Checkoff, of course, from Star Trek. That's right. His... Who, who said that uh, frequently. <laughs> Dramatic rules <laughs> of Mr. Checkoff. Hey, Captain. If there's spinach in the bottom, I don't even know what I'm doing. If you whistle, <laughs> you're stuck at the bottom of the ocean. And the spinach, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe they should have been in this. Yeah. There, there was a Star Trek comic yeah, think, strip at some point, right? Yeah, yeah I think there, there was. There was a comic book. Uh, well, yeah, there must have been a comic strip. I don't remember. The, I remember the Gold Key Star yeah. Trek comics. Certainly, yeah. be close enough. Yeah. <laughs> the The adventurers could have used their help. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mister Spock could have come in and straightened right. them out like in a matter of seconds. Uh, yeah. I kind of wish uh, more of the villains from the adventures had been involved in this plot. Yeah, Grimsby was a little lacking. Yeah. The The show could have used some more villain charisma. Some Ming, the Merciless. Yeah, there you go. Some whoever Mandrake deals with. Uh, yeah, Mandrake, I think, has to deal with uh, crooked venue owners that, that won't let him do his magic act. Uh, <laughs> that won't give him top belling or something. I don't right. know. Uh, Phantom, of course, has the anti-Phantom. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> Steve Cannon as Ralph Valley. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Got somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Probably some communist, uh, yeah. some, some commie mastermind somewhere. Dagwood has his boss. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Dithers. <laughs> Mr. That'd be Dithers. great if Mr. Dithers turned out to be like the mastermind <laughs> behind this. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been, yes, I would have liked that. Yeah. So uh, so what do you think of, uh, of this thing? Well, it, it's an interesting curio I, I agree with a lot of what you said. It, it doesn't always work, but I, I'm glad it exists. Mm-hmm. I would have liked to have seen a lot more of like High and Lois and, and Blondie. I think more of the comic characters. That was really the fascination for me because the adventure stuff is more like, okay, well, it's more like a straightforward adventure cartoon. Well, as straightforward as anything in this can be. Mm-hmm. To me, the real novelty was seeing like some of those older and oddball characters like Jigs and Maggie and... Yeah. And and high and lowest in this kind of setting. I would have liked to have seen some more of the uh the, the comedy bits with them actually. And Popeye yeah. was even for long stretches he's he's kind of like not even much of a presence in this. Yeah. I mean his highlight to me is, is his Ed Sullivan more right. than his exploits after eating the spinach. So yeah. to me that says something. Yeah. Uh how about you? Well, I have already said it's weird. I definitely think it's weird. I think there's some characters missing that we personally might have liked to have seen, but uh, we might hold off on that because I think we have a, a list idea related to some of that. Oh, okay. I like the idea of it. I don't quite, you know, I don't know if I get... I like the idea of having all these characters in the same thing. Like, you know, like a few years ago when, when the Blondie comic strip had its big... Oh, yeah. When it was the 75th anniversary mm-hmm. and, like... You know, all these different characters were showing up in Blondie or yeah. Blondie characters showing up to kind of celebrate it. And right. that's always fun when, like, somebody randomly shows up in another. 
It is. Strip. Yeah. Um, I, I I want to encourage that definitely. Yeah. I, w- I would have liked um, High and Lois's uh, that drunk. Oh yeah. Uh, thirsty. Thirsty to show. Up. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the whole Beetle Bailey military to show up. Yeah. To, to help save them or something. That would have been good. Yeah. Killer and Rocky and all those guys. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. I. And I also like I like the concept of the ABC Saturday Superstar movie. I mean, mm-hmm. it just seems like a weird thing to have an hour long, and, and this was like an hour long. It's movie, yeah, but not like an hour and a half. It's just in an hour time slot at nine thirty. It just seems it, it's a very weird thing. Uh, this this series of specials. I, I don't know. For me, it's like okay, I, I could picture that because like when. A little bit later, I would think of, okay, uh, the weekend story break or things like that would be more like later in the day. Yeah, because there was that thing where they adapted books. Is that mm-hmm. what you're talking about? Uh, well, there's, yeah, like storybook theater or something. Or, I forget what that was called. But, or, and that usually aired like really early, like okay. before all the other cartoons. Okay, I'm thinking more like, like the live action stuff. Oh, okay. It, I mean, just the idea of like a, an animated quote-unquote movie each week seems a little... Yeah. Interesting to me. I mean, I guess the, they were trying out different things. Mm-hmm. Clearly, this wasn't... I don't think this was a pilot for anything. But uh, No, they, they wouldn't have been able to s- sustain this kind of epic no. each week. I mean, maybe they could have done a King Features anthology series. And they should have. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that would have been a little strange. I guess there's, there's that thing in the 80s that we've seen... I think that was originally aired together. Like the there was the Dagwood or the Blondie, oh, the yeah. Dagwood and Hagar and yeah, what was there was a Beetle Bailey in that? Yeah, and like and, Kathy or no? There's there's a separate thing. Yeah, that was separate. I think. Okay. It was yeah, the thing it was like on two B T V. Yeah, was that was it like Lonnie Anderson as uh, Blondie? Well, there's that one too, <laughs> which is on YouTube. Okay. Or maybe she was Blondie, but there's some special on YouTube that I saw that uh, mm. where she's hosting and it has a bunch of. Little mm-hmm. shorts, I think. Then there was the other thing where there were like four different adaptations of the one where like Dagwood has like a or the kid is an inventor and all that. Yeah, like the. And those seem to be done by different studios, mm-hmm. but I think maybe they originally aired all together. That wasn't Saturday morning though, right? No, so I think that was a prime time. time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think uh, it, it's it's a cool concept and mm-hmm. is I I love uh, comic strips despite you know making some. Less than uh, complimentary <laughs> comments about some of them here. So, yeah, I think it's cool. Yeah, and they did do that at, uh, what was it, Defenders of the Earth. Oh, yeah. Later, where they took a bunch of the adventure characters and teamed like them up. Like it's a straightforward, like, superhero kind of yeah. deal. Yeah. Which I think is Flash Gordon and the Phantom and Mandrake. And yeah. Which is actually the first place I ever saw Mandrake. Yeah, Mandrake was, was somebody, like, I read about. I, I kind of wanted to read about him because I just thought he'd look cool. Yeah. But, yeah, Mandrake was... I just don't remember that being a, a no. presence on the comic page. It was after the fact that I read about him. Yeah, I don't remember any. I, yeah. I think the Phantom was in our in the Atlanta paper, but yeah. And there no. was like, like Mad Magazine was my exposure to some of these characters. I think mm-hmm. that's probably where I first <laughs> learned about Henry. Okay. Because it was Mad Magazine parroting <laughs> comic strips, and, and Henry would yeah. always show up in those kind of things. Right. Well, yeah, it's a uh, a curiosity for sure, and I think if you like comic strips it might be worth seeing yeah i guess my main issue with it might be just the the brand of comedy is not particularly appealing to me Hmm. or the way it's executed i guess i don't have a problem with slapstick but Mm -hmm. uh but then it's done for kids true and the animation is not that great yeah those captain crunch commercials (laughs) the quality of those is way higher than (laughs) it's it's a good point (laughs) this yeah, I wonder how they it, it the whole thing does feel kind of slapdash. Yeah, it's possible they didn't have a lot of time, or they wouldn't have taken it anyway to put this together. But right, yeah, I, I was I was enjoyed it. I would definitely re- would recommend it to anybody that's into comic strips. Yeah, uh, it's only an hour long, so right. As a comparison, there was like some of those Yogi Bear kind of things where they would have all those characters. Ah, uh, yeah, like the Hanna Barbera. Yeah, yeah, which seemed much more successful. At- putting a bunch of people together yeah you know like the christmas ones right right but those characters kind of go together it's not like yeah i was just kind of thinking about that it seems like more of a natural fit for some of those yeah and the ones that they that weren't natural fits they wouldn't necessarily make them be as big a part of the plot 
Right. Uh, I, I got to say, I mean, it's it's kind of a tough task if you say, okay, take all these King Features characters and we're going to combine the realistic ones with yeah. the, the cartoonish ones right. and make a story putting them all together. Yeah. This might be about as good as you could do in 1972 with that premise. Uh, uh, yeah. Although, and now we did say like maybe some more variety in the voice cast would have been nice. Mm, yeah. You could have done, you know, bring in somebody like June Foray or Mel Blanc or right. Dawes Butler yeah, I mean, I I can't I remember the guy's name, but he did a good job. But yeah, to spice this up, they they could have definitely done some some other things. Right. Okay. Time for some spinach. Yeah, some spinach and maybe some laughter and maybe a Dagwood sandwich. Sounds good. This episode brought to you by Spinach for all your rescue needs. This episode also brought to you by the Society of Concerned Comic Strip Dietitians. This episode also brought to you by Dagwood Sandwiches. That's a sandwich. Join us next time for another exciting episode of Battle of the Network Shows. Learn more, leave feedback, and suggest future episodes at battleofthenetworkshows.com. Follow us on Twitter at Batnet Shows, and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Battle of the Network Shows.